Too often, decisions about public investments are made without consulting the people who are supposed to benefit from them. Look at this hospital. It was built in a remote area that most people are unable to reach. But what does this have to do with public investments? Well, this hospital was built on land owned by a politician who was in charge of planning the project. Instead of considering what would benefit the community the most, the decision was made to profit an individual in power. What could have helped prevent that? Integrity pacts. Agreements where government, companies, and civil society commit to work together and ensure that a contract is awarded according to the law and to the people's needs. Next time you hear about a new public investment, remember, governments have access to tools that make decisions about them transparent and ensure that these meet the needs of communities. Learn more at transparency.org slash integrity packs. Everyone, our esteemed speakers and our, well, it could be higher now, 150 strong audience. And I have to say that you've all got extremely good taste because you've chosen this event, our event, to participate in. A very, very warm welcome to this high level conference on building transparency with integrity pacts in Europe. Very importantly, to begin with, we have interpretation in six languages, Portuguese, Italian, Polish, Slovenian, Hungarian and Greek. So please make sure that you are listening in the language of your choice and a nod to my speakers. I know I've grilled you already. Please do not speak too fast. My name is Katrina Sickle. I have the pleasure of navigating all of us and 11 very eloquent speakers through the next two and a half hours. Now, what's the context and the aim of our discussions? Very, very briefly, as you all know, the EU is embarking on its single largest economic recovery programme, and as it does so, open and accountable decision making is absolutely indispensable to protecting the EU's public resources demands. So if we look at it another way, I think we can say that the recovery process itself is offering this once in a lifetime opportunity to shape the future of EU integrity, public contracting, and investment. So our conference is going to share with you the experiences and the lessons learned from the Integrity Pact's pilot on the role of open decision making, citizen engagement and civic monitoring in safeguarding EU funds against fraud and corruption within a wider global context. And it also pinpoints the needs and the responsibilities and the dynamic between the various stakeholders implicated. So it's government, managing authorities, independent monitors to the citizens themselves. Just a quick one, for those of you who maybe are less deep in the topic, an integrity pact is a mechanism that allows collaboration between a public entity or a group of public entities and civil society to ensure that authorities and bidders act within the constraints set out by law, address corruption risks and foster trust in a public contracting project. So it's a public agreement through which the parties involved commit to refrain from any corrupt behaviour, to enhance transparency and accountability throughout the process and integrate an independent mechanism led by civil society to monitor compliance with the applicable regulation and the agreement itself and critically inform the public about it. But more on all of that from the experts, there are two ways that you can make your voice heard throughout our event at any time via Twitter, hashtag Integrity Pacts, and in the two panel discussions that we will have today via the chat channel on your viewing platform. So if you have a question or a comment, please shape it in no more than one sentence. Say who you are, if you wish, but say to whom that question or comment is addressed, but Morse code length, please. That's it from me. I think, I think I've been bossy enough. I'm now going to invite to set the scene our first speaker. Let's see who it is. Hello. Well, I didn't. Well, 
that's a surprise to have you there. That was a nice kind of, uh, that was a surprise, a, a, a sort of a switch up. I was hearing things going on. Um, now, of course, you have been the chair um, of Transparency International Board of Directors for some years now, since 2017. Is that correct? Okay, That's so but previously, you didn't just arrive in 2017 because you have served as president of Transparency International's chapter in Argentina. So a very warm welcome to you. As you saw there, I just gave the tip of the iceberg. We have quite a diverse audience. So let me give you a chance to sort of frame the discussions today and set the scene, the bigger picture for us. I'm gonna listen off stage and pop back at the end. Thank you very, very much. Thank Thank you very much, Katrina, for the introduction and welcome everybody for the, to participate in this very, very interesting and I think inspiring seminar on integrity packs. As Katrina has said, I have been working in, in and with Transparency International for many years in Latin America, in Argentina. I am talking today from Buenos Aires and also as the chair of Transparency International. But most of all, I have had the opportunity to see integrity packs working very well in order to guarantee uh, um, democracy strengthening and uh, citizens' participation in many different countries. And we are here to share with you the experiences, uh, lessons learned, and successes achieved by um, the 18 uh, integrity packs in 11 EU countries that has been applied during the last year uh, in, a in a pilot uh, program with the help and support of DG Radio. And we are very grateful for that support, which guarantees the opportunity for citizens, civil society organizations and Transparency International chapters in these 11 countries to uh, have the opportunity to use this very important tool. And I would say that uh, integrity packs sometimes are presented as just uh, an anti-corruption tool. They are much more than that. Integrity packs guarantees the engagement of citizens and put people at the center. And that's part of our collective endeavor in this recovery phase that we are facing after the COVID situation and the, after the COVID pandemic. We have to put back people at the center of our work. Public resources, public investment is devoted to, be, to make uh, people's life better, services of better quality, participation to be really participation. We have to make, uh, to achieve democracy beyond elections. And this integrity packs tool is a way to guarantee that. Uh, of course, we can, uh, go through through the whole experience of many countries and you will hear about that but what i want to highlight here is that integrity packs really help to enhance and guarantee transparency and accountability very important at this moment in eu where this recovery program is being launched and implemented lots of public resources will flow to many different investments, contracts, public procured tenders around the countries in EU. If governments really want to, um, to guarantee that the resources will go to the place they must go, integrity packs is the tool. And I would encourage uh, EU authorities and uh, the governments in the different countries to really use integrity pacts for, uh, for the use of these resources in the recovery program. As, as Katrina has mentioned, integrity pacts includes a monitor 
in between governments and a public, um, private sector contractors in uh, public procurement, in contracts. And these monitors help to uh, detect conflicts of interest and to help to manage those conflicts of interest in order to guarantee that we can avoid undue influence in public investment or the use of public resources. They, uh, this, invest, uh, this monitor can also guarantee and ensure that the regulations and the uh, integrity rules that has been agreed upon are uh, complied by all parties involved. And this also facilitates access to information by the public because this monitor organization can act as a channel to guarantee that public access the information about the design and implementation of the public policy, about the delivery and quality of public services that are devoted to benefit those citizens. And I said before that integrity packs are not just an anti-corruption tool. They, ha they, they have the possibility, and we have had the evidence in many countries, not only in EU, the, the integrity pact helps to, uh, to bridge the gap between authorities and citizens. This gap has created a very important uh, problem in lack of trust in institutions, lack of trust in uh, leadership, and this is a great problem nowadays. As you know, uh, through our global corruption barometer, Transparency International analyzed the experience of people with corruption in many countries. And in the last global barometer, we found that 52% of people in Europe, 52, think and believe that public contracts are the result of non-competitive and opaque transactions and tenders, which are characterized by conflicts of interest, bribe, pain, and undue influence. 52% of the people believe that's the reality. We have to offer and to use integrity packs as a way to guarantee that this will not happen again in those countries where that's the situation, and to guarantee that through openness and transparency and accountability, citizens will learn that resources are properly used. If government really, governments in general really wants to um, strengthen democracy, to reconnect with citizens, to guarantee participation and inclusiveness, to put governments at the service of people, to enhance transparency, integrity, and accountability. If that is what governments want, they have to use integrity packs, not only in public procurement. I would say that integrity packs should be mainstream in all public policies. And if we go that way, we will answer to the voice and demand of people. People want to move from the floor to the stage and mm -hmm. integrity pact guarantee that possibility. So to recover better, as we are saying for two years now, we need collective action. And the only possibility to sustain collective action is by rebuilding trust. And mm -hmm. we have to do that through participation, inclusiveness, transparency and accountability. And the tool for doing that is integrity parts. I hope you enjoyed the seminar. Welcome. Don't go yet. Thank you so much, uh, Delia Ferrero Rubio. And um, 
Listen, as last time we met, I have a bazillion questions for you. I'm just not allowed to ask them all because time doesn't allow. I want to qualify one thing. There you said that, you know, uh, the citizen, we, the people, the beneficiary have a choice. No, that was my question. Sorry. The integrity packs are quite a fluid instrument and they really are something where the monitoring and the oversight is from A to Z. So if, uh, as we saw the example in the video, a hospital is going to be built, do does the citizen have a choice? Right. It's not like they're brought in later when, oh, gosh, I actually don't have a choice at the outset when I could actually have my voice heard or they're brought in right then? I think that integrity packs are, of course, there are plenty of models and we have applied that yeah. since the 90s. So we have learned a lot. We have incorporated technology. But as a principle, I would say that integrity packs should be at the center of this investment from the very beginning Mm -hmm. to the very end mm -hmm. in order to mm -hmm. control the complete cycle it is not yeah. just calling the people afterwards it's consulting mm -hmm. first participation guaranteed from the very beginning where the hospital should be placed and who will participate in the tenders who which yeah. will be the rules from the very beginning till the end when we can check whether the resources has been correctly applied and the hospital is really useful for people. And one more, and then I promise that's it because I'm, I'm aware of the time. Um, just to be clear, you obviously, everyone knows watching, I use the word myself, you brought it up again, you know, it guarantees not just transparency, but accountability. Have you seen instances in your illustrious career in this area where, you know, it's not just oh, something has been uncovered and then, ah, people just get away with it. Have you seen instances where, you know, um, people's concerns have been satisfied and there has been due enforcement and due process afterwards? Because it's all very one, yes. well, isn't it? Bringing things to light, but it's what you do with that. Yeah, of course. We have seen that uh, raising red flags in the right moment is appropriate to avoid greater conflicts and to yeah. wait at the end of the project to, to check whether it has fulfilled the qualities, for instance, of the service, of the building or whatever it is. So we have seen that that's useful in the appropriate time and that is guaranteed by Integrity Pact because it is a continuum. The monitor is there for the whole period. And we have also learned that uh, through this participation, Civil society organizations get, uh, have had the opportunity to gain experience and to detect what the problems are in procedures, in regulation, yeah. in legislation, in order to make proposals after the, the concrete project has been finished, to make proposals to better the procedures, to strengthen regulation and to create whatever mechanism is needed to guarantee that in the future, the same mistake will not be committed. Thank you very much. I just, and that's great that you've explained that because obviously you said yourself, we're gonna hear some different sort of permutations today. There are lots of different, we're gonna to just touch on some and it's helpful to see about what might come out of backside of those and, and what the process is afterwards. But I thank you so much. I know that you're going to be following the event, but um, fantastic that you have in such a comprehensive and warm way kick things off so magnificently for us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And so to all of you lovely people who are watching, uh, we cannot open this event without hearing from the European Commission uh, DG Regio. That's absolutely critical. They are behind these integrity pacts and we would like to hear the perspective of the EU, why they're so important, why, um, why we have them at all, this initiative, what the expectations are. So in order to talk about that more, we do have, well, a very good speaker. Let's find out who it is. A 
warm welcome to you, Commissioner. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'm not going to take any more of your time. I'm going to hand over the floor to you and I'll pop back at the end. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Catherine. And, uh, and thank you very much for the work done by uh, Transparency International. And, uh, and a warm, warm welcome to Querida Delia Ferreira Rubio and uh, dear chair of the of transparency international uh, dear colleagues uh, distinguished guests in fact i i, I sincerely welcome this event uh, which is uh, i i want to welcome you and your interest and your work and it, i consider this event uh, at the same time an end and a beginning uh, because it marks the end and the successful conclusion of the integrity pact pilot project, it was a pilot project, but it is also uh, the first in a series of events to discuss the good governance of the European Union regional policy. Uh, integrity and good governance are absolutely essential, essential also to the perception of people, because fraud, a real fraud is very limited. It's less <coughs> than 1% of the overall projects that are managed, but nevertheless, public perception as, uh, as uh, uh, Dalia just mentioned it, uh, is, is completely different. And, um, and in fact, integrity and good governance are as at, the, at the core of the credibility of the policy. Uh, and Europeans have entrusted us with the 420 billion euros of investment. This is a massive investment. Uh, the, and it is, it is a, a once in a generation level of funding um, so it has got to trigger a once in a generation change. Of course, uh, we want to make uh, building back better. Uh, so a green digital recovery for all regions of Europe, but with more money, with uh, more power comes uh, more responsibility. And, um, and we cannot let Europe down. Our progress must be shining examples of effective investment and they must represent european values uh, among which i align integrity and transparency uh, this these values must apply directly to our work as a european institution as well as to all the national uh, regional uh, authorities involved and this is a partnership process, so involved in the implementation of our policies and instruments. And citizens must trust the way we deliver on these uh, policies and projects. And in fact, we must make the best use of these exceptional funding levels, delivering them in a timely and effective manner. So integrity and good governance are not optional extras. They are the foundation and the precondition of, of success. Uh, this was our motivation already in 2013, when uh, we started with the European Commission through the DG Radio, we started discussions on the integrity pacts in, in close collaboration with the Transparency International, in fact. We were particularly concerned with public procurement. Yes, there are different areas that have got to be addressed, but public procurement, it represents uh, around 14% 14 14 of the total GDP. So it's the, the seventh uh, use of the European Union GDP, gross develop, uh, GDP, so the overall income. Uh, public procurement represents just under half of the European structural and investment funds. So good public procurement requires, uh, in fact, a high level of trust from businesses and from civil society. Trust that the competition is fair, that the competition is open. Trust that it is uh, driven by competent authorities. And this is why we prioritize public procurement for integrity pacts. And the, in 2016, we, after all these debates and reflection, together with our partners, uh, Transparency International, we launched the Integrity Pacts pilot projects. It, we have 
18 integrity texts in 11 member states. Uh, I can I can very uh, quickly name them: Bulgaria, Czech Republic, Greece, Hungary, Italy, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Portugal, Romania, Slovenia. And the Integrity Pact project includes two key dimensions. First, finding innovative methods to strengthen administrative capacity and improve public procurement practices. This was enabled uh, by the second dimension, which is using the expertise, and there is a lot of expertise of civil society, and giving civil society organizations, credible civil society organizations, a role in public decision making. So the Integrity Pact pilot has proved that civil society can help public administrations become more transparent, transparent, more efficient, and more result-oriented. This has been a unique project in terms of scale and in terms of the method of cooperation, not just for the Commission, but I believe also for you, for Transparency International. Now, the challenge continues as we prepare new programs and the 420 billion euros of European investment for the near future. A key precondition for success is good governance. This level of funding, together with the recovery and resilience facility, as it was just mentioned a couple of minutes ago, comes once in a generation. We must make the best possible use of this opportunity. We must have the right public policies in place. We must have well functioning legal, institutional, and procedural arrangements, and we must have good administrative capacity at the different levels. This is why we have given more weight to administrative capacity in the 2021 programs, the programs that are starting now. This is why we have encouraged member states to adopt a strategic approach to their administrative capacity building and this is why we ask that all the actors involved in management and implementation should have the capacity to effectively administer and use European invest investments. So, in fact, we in the Commission have put in place a number of tools to support member states in their efforts to improve. First, tools to develop roadmaps for administrative capacity, mapping strengths identifying gaps. Second, tools to increase capacity in key areas such as public procurement or state aid. Third, tools to prevent actually fraud and corruption and to support transparent and open contracting. Fourth, uh, tools to network and exchange with peers, experience and good practice. And fifth, tools to increase engagement of civil society, of both citizens and civil society organizations. And uh, I, I close, I will close by saying that this is just the beginning. As you can see, uh, our task is uh, far from over, it's just starting. So we are at a defining moment in our investments. Uh, greater challenges, greater funding, require greater efficiency, greater transparency and greater performance. I am convinced that member states, regions and European institutions, um, we can all benefit greatly from the, this positive experience, this integrity pact experience. The Commission will continue to encourage and support them in the new programs through guidance, through exchange of good practices and through the training we will see during the next two days in this meeting. And today we invite you to reflect on how to ensure together the future of clean contracting and investment in Europe. Tomorrow you will meet the practitioners that develop the pilot projects. And next week on the 16th of February, we will organize a forum for managing authorities to share and explore new ideas for building administrative capacity, relying on the experiences gained from the roadmaps pilot. We continue on the 1st of March, 
by presenting concrete tools for administrative capacity building prepared for you by the Directorate General for Regional and Urban Policy. And finally, on the 10th of March, uh, I will be happy to meet you again, I hope, uh, for a political debate on citizens' pa participation in cohesion policy. Uh, this weighty agenda reflects weight we give to integrity and good governance. Our investments will not succeed without them. They are the foundation on which we will build a green and digital recovery, which benefits, and this is not just words, we want it to be in practice, fulfilled that will benefit all of Europe's regions and in fact will leave no citizens or regions behind. For this, we count on your support and on your discussion today, tomorrow and in the weeks and months to come. Thank you once again to all of you and in particular to our partners in this endeavour. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner. And I'm glad there because I think it will be a question in people's heads, the legacy of any project of this. You said it, it, it was quite a considerable scope. So I think it's very clear from you, you are saying, listen, this is also a shared endeavour going forwards. These are the tools that we are giving, uh, providing in terms of EU support to member states. You use the words there, we count on your support. And I also pick up something you said a little bit uh, further back. You said, all of this in this pilot has also been about finding innovative methods to strengthen the participation of civil society. So it would be interesting to hear from the speakers in our two panels what some of those are and what they might suggest that they haven't seen. But again, in this spirit of legacy and looking forward could be some of those methods. So I thank you so much for being with us. It's been a pleasure and a privilege, and you have very nicely taken us shortly into the first of two panel discussions. So uh, until the next time, and good luck with the series of um, events, because as you say, it is part of a series. You've given it due weight. Thank you very much, Commissioner. So there you have it. We have a lovely scene setting there, I think, already, even if you leave now, but don't. Seriously, I'm not inviting you to leave now. You've already heard an awful lot, but now we really need to get more into the nuts and bolts of all of this. And um, first of all, we're going to stay perhaps a little bit generally with the bigger picture in the first um, uh, panel chat and then uh, dive down even more into the details and some more examples from different member states. But what is this first panel discussion all about? Let's have a look.